Lock us in, load us in, pop in that A-track, spin the tape. Here we go. Hey now everyone, welcome back to a brand new episode of the Star Wars Time Show, and yes, it is the Star Wars Time Show proper. It's Friday night, although when you're listening to it, it may be Tuesday night or Tuesday afternoon, it doesn't fucking matter. All that matters is that Nick and Matt and Pete, some he's somewhere. By the way, he got saw by a vet and he's not as close to death as I have foreseen. So just like Palpatine... My force powers are kind of fucking with my future predictions. (laughs) Anyways, we're here to do what we do on a Friday night Star Wars time show. And that is to tackle the fandom of Star Wars. That's where we get into our top five Star Wars artist features. You know, that's kind of what we do on Instagram. If you follow us at Star Wars Time Show every week, we're rolling out at least four or five, six new uh, featured shots a day. And these shots come from people that are either tagging us at Star Wars Time Show or or hashtagging Star Wars Time Show, or just when yours truly find something that I think looks badass, I'll share it because we're that we're we're that type of guy. We're that type of people. We love you. We love Star Wars. We love Star Wars fans. We love people that love Star Wars. All right, Nick. So uh, let's get right into it. I mean, we have some topics to get into outside of our fandom segment. I mean, there's still nothing major. Episode nine that's been revealed. Yes, this is the eve of May the Fourth be with you, which is kind of a bummer. I mean, the timing isn't great for when we record to when the cast comes out. So maybe something will come out tomorrow. If it does, we'll make sure to capture it on our special topics cast, which we usually record on Tuesday nights. But, buddy. I shared them all week long, and you do your job on Fridays, and that is whittling down the weekly shares to your five favorite, which, again, all of the shares we put out on Star Wars Time Show, hashtag Star Wars Time Show, are badass. We just like to highlight the most badass, or the ones that at least appeal to my buddy Nick. So, Nick, go ahead, and let's kick off our top five instagram star wars artist shares of the week yep so as most of you know if you're a true star wars fan you've definitely heard this we had some rough news this week peter mayhew the the person behind chewbacca the life essence of chewbacca from the original trilogy even in the prequel trilogy and even flowing into the force awakens you know passed away he was 74 years old and obviously Peter has had health problems for a long time. He's a very, very big man. If you've ever seen him in person, I think he's 7'6", or he was 7'6", and he's just a massive, massive human being, and he had a massive yeah, be- Being heart. super tall is not healthy. It's not. Like, eventually your body just can't take the strain. It can't take the, the, the you know, muscle and the, and the energy needed to, to keep yourself upright. And, you know, he, he succumbed to his age and his, his health problems. So in this week's top five, we have tribute shots in here for, for our Mr. Mayhew, for our Chewbacca. And, and you know, we know that, that Junus is here holding the torch for Chewbacca, but the original is Peter Mayhew, right. and we need to right. pay tribute to this and, man. And, and yeah, and, and Eunice, however the fuck you want to say his name, Jonas He'll be the first one to admit. I mean, there is no Chewbacca without Peter. So, yeah. As Nick said, I mean, the the the, the toy photography community, as expected, responded in droves to Peter's passing. Which, which, by the way, uh, based on when we're recording, was you know less than twenty four hours ago, and we we already got an amazing response from the toy photography photography community so as nick said he's highlighted some of those as i tried to share um today actually the day of our recording so go ahead buddy who's number one here number one here we have star wars underscore rick with a beautiful tribute to chewy we have the entire cast the entire main cast of the original trilogy here and the 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 shot depicts han and chewy in an embrace 
but then you have the rest of the family here around them. You know, Leia kind of putting her hand on Han's uh, arm. You also have Luke in the background. This is farm boy Luke. This is original episode four Luke. Um, also touching uh, Chewie's shoulder. And then you have on the outside, you have C-3PO and R2-D2. Again, like, you know, these types of shots, especially in the moment that we're in now, they're very touching. They're very uh, filled with emotion. And I think, you know, the, the captions of all of these Chewbacca shots really speak volumes. I mean, even if it's only a few words, like Star Wars Rick here, his original caption was just so long, old friend. And I mean for you know we we've heard that line spoken in star wars before so using it in this context is 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 perfect and it's poignant um really enjoy the shot and in the background you can see that they are standing in front of the falcon it looks like we're in is this echo base i think it looks like kind of like echo Base. this honestly nick i believe this looks like a shot or even the matte painting that was used in return of the jedi okay you know when when han and lando are kind of talking about don't fuck up the falcon bro. yes 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 uh-huh. that, that's my guess i mean clearly as nick kind of was hinting at here this is a what i like to call a digi rama shot i mean i don't know if work more or less coined that term but that's what it is digi rama again is where you use a digital background for your photography uh and, and the trick here as star wars rick has figured out is is being able to capture your figures with this digital background while also making the scale kind of make sense i mean it is kind of difficult when you're using a a picture that you download or something that does isn't quite in the real world and you're trying to pair it up with stuff that is in the real world it's tough to get that scale but i think star wars rick kind of nailed that here and he's also using uh nick you probably didn't notice it because again you don't waste all your money on this shit (laughs) not that i'm saying buying toys is a waste it's obviously not because i spend a lot of money on it but you know nick doesn't quite get figure lines this that and the other thing but these are uh sh figure arts buddy so these come straight from japan and these are going to be running people at least in the states upwards of 60 to 80 dollars per figure uh, and as you see, I, at least I hope you see, uh, I mean, the, the details in these figures compared to even the very, very good-looking Hasbro Black Series figures, you're still not getting the level of facial sculpts that you're getting in these figure arts, and that's why people like me will overpay and, and drop 70 bucks on one of these yeah, bad boys. Yeah, I could tell, like, immediately looking at these figures, you know, Han's face, Luke's face, yeah. even the detail it's, in the hair is very, it's very... heads and above. I mean, yeah. and what, what Hasbro's done with the uh, photo reel technology is amazing. I mean, again, we're talking a $20 figure that looks pretty fucking close to the likeness of the actor versus a 60 to $100 figure when we're talking SH figure arts. But even just the, 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 the sculpt and the paint is still, in my opinion, and it should be. I mean, you pay for what you get. That is a legit saying. It does make complete sense. It rings true in every aspect of life, especially in collecting. So if I'm going to sp- spend $80 on a figure, yes, I should get one that looks heads and tails above a $20 figure. Again, those $20 figures these days are still looking pretty fucking good. They do. They do. But excellent shot here. Excellent yeah. composition. Good job, Rick. Yeah. Way to go. So at good Star Wars. Good, good posing. Really, it, it, and, and to me, the reason I initially shared this, it's the, I, I felt it was a good use of Digirama, but also the pose. And, yeah. And to me, posing is, is everything. It's something I've, I've talked about. It's my biggest struggle is posing. So when I see great poses, that just kind of brings the emotion out in these static, lifeless figures. Absolutely. You can you can kind of feel, you know, this this shot and then of the course. emotion it brings Yeah, of here. course. So well done at Star Wars underscore Rick on Instagram. Good Star job, buddy. Wars Rick. Next up, we have, you know, we have the chewy shots sprinkled in here, but I also wanted to put some, you know, some non Chewbacca, non tribute shots in here. So the first one that is a non chewy shot is from Josh Deleff at Josh Deleff on Instagram. And this is a this is a fantastic shot. I mean, it really pops. What we have here is a clone. It's a, 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 it's a custom clone trooper. Yep. Uh, it looks like a, a Gen 3 clone trooper, so a Rots trooper. I mean, as you're getting closer to the helmet where you've had the 
you know how the, the, the original clones, Nick, right? I mean, their their eye slits and nose slits all were kind of one. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then as we shifted towards the stormtrooper look, the eyes started to kind of get their own separate slots and the nose piece. And to me, what Josh did here, I believe he's using a Commander Cody figure as the base, and he repainted it red, and I'm I'm going to throw it out there, and if he does listen, hopefully we get some clarity. So, Josh, when we tag you, surprise, we love your work. Maybe you'll comment if you're listening. But I'm also thinking that black cape on him, Nick, comes from a Kylo Ren figure. That actually, yeah, now that you mention that, the way that it kind of leans heavily to the right shoulder and is yeah. off of the left, um yeah that does look like the the cape that that i've seen on kylo right. figures but I, I love customs and again i mean he, he i believe this is a cody custom or he at least ripped the visor off of a cody and super glued it onto another clone clone figure but i, I just you're not only getting a good picture here but again you're getting the extra creativity in building the custom i mean he he had to do the paint he had to do the uh, kit bashing if he is indeed using Kylo's cape or uh, Cody's visor. So it's just fun stuff. I mean, as far as I'll dive into this type of stuff is weathering a figure, and I just half-ass it and throw on some shoe polish and wipe it off, and I'm just like, hey, look what I did. <laughs> this type of stuff to me, I mean, this is art within art. Yeah, the the weathering, and, and especially within the, the environment that he has this trooper in, you know, walking through – almost kind of like a marsh or a swamp land. You can see rocks all around. It's almost, it almost looks like a hot spring of sorts because you can see yeah, yeah, steam. Yeah, yeah. yeah dude. I, I mean, image. pure outdoor photography is always going to be my preferred way. I, I have gotten used to, and I do love shooting, and this is air quotes, big time people in a studio, a.k.a. my basement. Uh, but when it comes down to me, if I can get some solid natural light, uh, with some practical effects out there in nature any day. I mean, any day I would be, I would prefer to do that over indoor stuff. And Josh's shot here kind of is the reason why. I, I just, I, I love organic, lifelike outdoor shots. Yeah, this is beautiful. Fantastic shot here at jo- Josh DeLeff on Instagram. Well done, sir. Next up, we have another Chewy shot, and this one is from One Six Shooter. Definitely a returning top five oh, member. Yeah, this is a this is one of the the pimps of the toy photography community. Uh, Trevor, aka One Six Shooter. This is a guy that won essentially the overall I'm a Mac Daddy Star Wars fan awards in 2018 with his recreation of the A New Hope poster with action figures and this is kind of what he's done here in this shot nick because i believe this is a recreation of an actual shot for say a big time magazine back in the 70s or 80s yeah Uh, i'm almost positive this is a legit recreation either way these are one six hot toys star wars figures and it's his commemoration to chewbacca yeah and it's you know these these figures in particular, even in comparison to the figure arts, like the the quality of the figure, the quality oh, yeah. of Bro, the these, face. Bro, these are the ones is. where I, I'm telling you, like, oh yeah, um, the reason I have a I get heartburn when I spend twenty bucks on Swago is because I spend two thousand dollars a year on Star Wars Barbies. <laughs> these are the Star Wars Barbies. I mean, each figure here, buddy, two hundred dollar minimum. Whew. Whew. Minimum two hundred dollars. Chewbacca's probably three hundred plus. Yeah, I mean, if you look at this Chewy figure, I mean, I'm sure people listening. I have to him. This, He's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he even comes with a fucking comb because it's all real hair. Yeah, it's it, this is real hair. You know the the shot, the fantastic shot from Star Wars Rick in the first one was you know all a plastic sculpt. This is actual like Chewbacca is made out of real hair, and just I don't know the way that that one six recreated the shot. The, the fact that he went with a black and white uh, filter for this, it just makes it feel so poignant. It makes it feel like this is this is pulling straight from the 1970s. And the fact that these figures are the hot toys, super expensive figures, it, it's almost like you're not even looking at toys. It's it's like you're looking oh, yeah. at actual human beings here in this in this image. And, um, 
that just 100%. goes yeah. the quality of his work is always top notch matt got to speak to him a little bit when we were at star wars celebration met up with him at a brewery so oh, i didn't just speak with him i even gave him a hug gave him a hug that's beautiful yeah. That's, beautiful. That's how we are. That's how we are <laughs> in the toy photography community. We're, we're all a bunch of a happy, uh, lovey-dovey group here. I mean, we're, we're all about hugs, not drugs. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that. Well, maybe <laughs> maybe hugs and drugs. Yeah, maybe a little mixture. Drugs and hugs and booze and whatever. <laughs> whatever else, but yeah. Bring it on, but either way, I mean, Trevor's, I mean, he's a fucking pimp. Yeah. When, when it comes to shooting one six-scale figures, the guy does it professionally, and it shows. And then this shot again, I mean, he even clarified this is this is a three-year-old shot. I mean, I still think it looks exquisite. Uh, but the guy's talents and skills have obviously in, increased and have been enhanced since then. So his, his 2019 work is even better looking than the awesome stuff he was putting out in 2016. So moral of the story is, people, follow at 1-6 shooter definitely next up th- this shot when you know i i, I read the it's caption brother from another about mother right here from from bud fu too is just incredible when you think about all of the work that went into it so what we have here is a shot of banthas and then also the sand people or the tuscan raiders that are accompanying them but what matt what you filled me in on is that these um these banthas are handmade yeah, yeah. You, you don't buy these at a store, Nick. These aren't like where we, we could go out and buy Emphis Nest with her swoop bike combo. Yeah. I mean, Bud Futu, a.k.a. Jay Haywood, and the only reason I know that is because his last name is the same as mine. It's spelled the same way. So I feel like somehow we're related. Through the force. I mean, somewhere at some point in time, our ancestors banged and <laughs> exchanged goo. It's possible. All right. I mean, it shows. I mean, the guy loves Star Wars. He likes taking pictures of Star Wars. I mean, hello. There's some common themes going on here. It's called the Haywood. Just like the Rise of Skywalker, we're talking the Rise of Haywood. It's the same shit. Oh, yeah. The, it, it, Either way, Jay, Jay in the community is, is considered to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest, diorama creator uh, he can clearly also create his own custom figures because these banthas are insane. Uh, and the sand people, I mean, they look that good jet just because Hasbro made them look that good. I mean, they, they these are fantastic Hasbro figures. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this almost looks like you know a scene from a movie that we haven't oh, yeah. seen I mean, it's, yet. It's, and that's what Jay goes for, and that's why he makes his dios look so realistic is because he faithfully 100 percent i mean my challenge to get some pictures showed at the hasbro booth for star wars celebration 19 was to recreate scenes and i i took a lot of artistic license to do so jay literally recreates scenes to a fucking t like down to the last light ray speck of dust uh, random fucking background item jay will get it built into his dioramas yeah it's a beautiful fantastic shot bud food too check him out yeah it, it's a Give great a follow. follow you will not be disappointed so does I mean, he, he also likes... sell his dioramas yes okay. yes i believe his his um sale account like if you're interested in shit that he makes it, it or getting commissions is blue harvest studios yeah blue it's blue harvest dios blue harvest dios there, there you okay go. Yeah, there you go all right yep. so jay i mean you, you can pay us whenever you want just yeah. send the check in the free mail. free advertising no. right. you got it buddy <laughs> we got your back but we do require a bit of commission yep um last shot here is another um another kind of it's a new account i like this i I like finding new accounts and i also like finding new accounts that nick zeroes in on for his top five yeah so i mean the the, well so the account is abraham it's kind of a weird instagram handle so it's at abraham dot 98 underscore so the underscore is the last part of it and it's another tribute shot to chewbacca and peter mayhew but what's beautiful about this is that the shot is actually a trio of of tributes because you have Peter Mayhew is who exactly. has passed recently. You have Carrie Fisher's character, and you have R two D two who was played by Kenny Baker. All three of these characters, you know, real life, you know, actors well, I mean, or actresses uh, have passed. We technically, in the original trilogy, we had the big six. Yes, right? 
You had the droids. You had Leia, Han, Luke, and Chewie. Yep. You could argue Obi Wan may should be counted, but I don't think so. I think I you mean, might he, throw he, Billy D in there too. You might throw Lando. Possibly, but for all intents and purposes, when we're talking the trilogy, it's the big six. Yes. I mean, Lando came in halfway through the second movie. Obi Wan died, you know, three quarters, two thirds of the way into the first movie. So, really, when you think about the OT, the characters you're thinking about are the droids, Han, Luke, Leia, Chewie. So, what this picture captures are the three departed actors and actresses out of that big six. So, it's Peter, it's Carrie, and it's Kenny. Yeah, and I thought that that was beautiful. And you can see the remaining three in the foreground being Han, 3PO, and Luke kind of wa- wa- watching them walk out into the light. Yeah, exactly. It's not a complicated shot. It's just a white a white room, a white foreground and background and well, it's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, this to me honestly, Nick is is my the, the favorite tribute I saw uh last night and today. And yeah. That, that's why it made it here. Yeah, I mean, it's a very emotional shot. You don't even see yeah. anybody's face. You just see nope. them Walking into the light, as it's, you said, so it's just a it's it's just a well done composition. I mean, the the poses are on, the idea is perfect, mm-hmm. uh, and it was just it was just executed very well. So it, it's a great it's a great touching homage to three of the big six who have moved on to the fours. Indeed, so. At Abraham period dot ninety eight underscore is the account to follow. If you want to follow any of these accounts that we went over today, make sure to jump into our top five Instagram picks of the week on Star Wars Time dot net. They're all linked there. You can follow them directly from the post. So make sure to get in there and do that. And also, if you want to be featured on the Star Wars Time Show top five, make sure to use the hashtag. Star Wars Time Show. We see them coming through. Matt, you've been tracking it, and you're, you're, you said today they're picking up. We see organic tags of Star Wars Time yeah, Show. Yeah, we're almost at 1,100 uh, uses of the hashtag, you know, pound sign Star Wars Time Show. A lot of those have been me, my personal account, at Haywood Pop, or just anytime I share, I always add the, the Star Wars Time Show. But there's been a noticeable uptick in organic uses of the tag as well as just straight up tagging our account and we love it we're on it we're looking i try to at least comment and like every shot just for you taking the time to to tag us i will give you at least that it doesn't mean you're going to make the the features or nick's top five but we see you we it's see good, you yes, for sure. exactly. You're you're on our radar. If anything else, yeah, we appreciate all the tags out there, and then follow us at Star Wars Time Show on Instagram. All right, so we've been talking about it for a little bit now. Peter Mayhew's passing, and you know, it's it's one of those things that when I saw it yesterday, and you posted it in you know in the channel in our Slack channel, I kind of like I was reading the message, and I was sitting on my couch, and like my girlfriend was sitting right across from me, and I was like awestruck and like I could I didn't have words like I you know reading that and you know the same thing well, happened dude, with the Carrie. first the, the first word I got was from Ryan the intern he's like damn chewy and at first I was like what the fuck yeah and, th- and then I was like what could this mean and I said I believe my reply to him was like what happened and then it hit me as soon as I was like oh shit and I just typed him Peter yeah and that's when he's like, yeah, man. I was like, ah, oh, that's a bummer. Yeah, that it, it's it's one of those things that as Star Wars fans and as Star Wars fans that are in kind of, you know, Matt's a little bit older than me. We're both in our 30s. But, like, in the age range that we are now, like, we have to come to grips with the fact that a lot of these icons to us, a lot of these, these legends from the original trilogy are, are at the age to where, you know, this starts happening. Like, we saw it with... Kenny we saw it with uh, Carrie and now we see it with pa- with Peter and I don't think it, it gets any easier regardless of your thoughts on you know whose character was cooler or, or you know whose character played a more significant role in the movie or anything like that seeing somebody that you grew up watching and, and you know brought Star Wars to life for you is always going to be difficult and um, you know so I, I wanted to take a moment to just kind of point out 
maybe you know maybe we could list off you know w what our favorite Chewbacca moment is for each of us from the original trilogy and um you know just just kind of talk about like what like when you first saw Star Wars or you, like you know when you got into it like did Chewie what was what were your thoughts on Chewie did he have like a significant you know, place for you? I, I, it's tough when literally I can't remember. Like, I've been in the Star Wars so long, I honestly can't remember when I got into it. Yeah. So I can't really give you my initial reaction to Chewbacca outside of I always felt like he's been a part of my family. I mean, it's just anything OT, Nick, has always felt a part of my life. I don't know how else to explain it. I mean, it's just I've I've not known a life without Chewbacca or Han or Leia or Luke or Obi. I mean, it just pretty much I guess I'm seeing it through my own kid growing up now and the way she's taken to it uh, without me even forcing it down her throat. Like she just genuinely loves it. I mean, tonight, as soon as she got home from daycare, the first thing she said because she knew we're going into the weekend was, Daddy, can I watch Empire Strikes Back? <laughs> it almost makes me cry now just thinking about it. But it's it, it, it plays into what I'm trying to say, uh, trying to answer your question. I just, I've known Peter Mayhew's Chewbacca since I've known my own existence. Yeah. So while I'm not someone that's going to lament and get all depressed because a celebrity died, because in the end they're a fucking celebrity... I mean, we have real-life heroes dying every second that never get recognized, don't get nearly the accolades and, and admiration that someone like Peter would get just for playing a character in a movie. But being a fan of Star Wars, of course, it is sad. Yeah. And uh, I guess when you're asking, like, what are some of the moments that stand out to me, I mean... Uh, I think one of the biggest moments that stand out was I always knew that Chewbacca was the better half of the Han and Chewie relationship. Chewbacca was the good guy. Chewbacca was the one that kept Han honest. And that was showcased in, in a moment that to this day still stands out to me. And that's when Han rejects Luke's plea to help the rebellion. And Chewie... Even though we don't know, we don't know shit of what Chewie has ever said, but you know what he says. You guys know what I'm talking about. Chewie in that Yavin Masasi temple hangar literally says to Han, at least what I've thought after Han rejects Luke, like, you're a fucking piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's Chewie to me. Like, Chewie's always been the kind of the foil to Han, the, the one to check Han's ego, to check Han's, you know, distractions into paying debts and saving himself. Chewie's the one, I think, that is always kind of push Han to do what's the right thing for everyone versus what's the right thing for Han Solo. Yeah. I mean, that's a perfect moment to encapsulate, like, who that character is and, and what he meant not only to to yeah, I mean, Han, Chewie made Han a better person. Yeah, plain and simple. Yeah, I mean he was he was neat. Like Han needed him. If 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 Chewbacca wasn't there, Han probably would have either been dead or far into some crime syndicate that you know he he couldn't get his way out of. But you know, Chewbacca was that character. Was that that light side to his kind of more scoundrelish ways that saved him from you know, a, a tougher life. And, you know, since you went, you know, with the emotional moment, I think like I'll, I'll call out three and one of them actually is going to come from one of the newer films. I think that in the, the, the part in the newer film, it was Peter Mayhew playing him. Um, so what my first one was is it's just I love when Chewie is emotional because it, it, it was Peter's time to bring that character to life through his body and through his actions and through his, you know, gesticulation. So like, right. I mean, Peter, the, you gotta understand like Anthony Daniels, he's been able, yes, he's limited in his movements, but the, those limited movements are what make C3PO who he is. But 
Anthony is also allowed to speak. Yeah. I mean, just like Kenny with R2 and Peter with Chewie, their, their, their only way to bring the character to life has been through their physical performance. And that's what makes someone like Peter so special is because he made this character. It was literally just a man in a dog uniform made him feel just as important as the human cast. Yeah. So without being able to speak. Exactly. Like you knew his significance in the story and you knew, like you said, Matt, you know, you knew what Chewie was saying without having to see subtitles or have somebody yeah. translate for him. To this day, I know everything he says in my head. Yeah, exactly. And that's all that matters. I, I don't care what he's act exactly saying. We know what he is saying. Yeah. And that's all that matters. So what my, my first moment is from episode five when they're flying the Falcon. You know, the Falcon has is has been the you know their their um hyperdrive has been disabled they're being chased and Chewie is doing what Chewie does when the ship is fucking up Hans in the, in the front piloting it and he's down in the trenches and he's fucking fixing it and you can see him like Han yells back to him at one point he just says Chewie and then che- he pops up and he just yells right back at him he takes he's like fuck you yeah. he's like leave me the fuck alone i'm trying you asshole it's not my fault this ship's a piece of junk yep. and then he goes back in and he smacks it with a wrench and you see the the electricity come uh, off yeah. of it like i mean that is one of the best moments cuz he's just like all right you want me to fucking fix it <laughs> fuck and he just starts banging on it yeah. just like i would try to fix something yeah it just starts hitting it with a wrench i mean those <laughs> moments you know are, are, are when Peter could really bring the emotion to that character. I mean, it, it, that is a character that is completely reliant, like you said, on physical performance and emotion that is shown through physicality or through body language. Well, and, I and, think you're right, Nick. I honestly think Peter shines the most in Empire because there, there are multiple comedic moments, heated moments between him and Han, but also touching moments because if you remember in Empire... I mean, Chewie's the one that shows the most emotion over C-3PO getting wasted. Yeah. I mean, you you literally, at one point in time, seeing, like, putting C-3PO's head up against his, like, ugh. Yeah. Like, like basically saying, like, what the fuck have we gotten ourselves into by coming here? Yeah, that was... Uh, And then even when Han's getting frozen in carbonite, I mean... Yeah, Leia is emotional, but you could argue that Chewie takes it even harder than Leia. I mean, when when that smoke comes through, I mean, Chewie lets out a like. I mean, you can you can feel that he is being pained by watching his friend getting frozen and taken away. Yeah, and again, that that's all just Peter doing it through his physical acts in in opening his mouth and having Ben Burt pipe some fucking sounds into it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's incredible the way that he could bring that that character to life. So actually that like the moment with 3PO in in Empire was my second one because like you said, it goes to show that like this character who most people would look at and immediately assume is some sort of cold-blooded killer or just like a like muscle, like alien muscle that is kept Dude, around. Dude, he let Ugnaughts pick on him. Yeah. Like, Ugnaughts bullied him, and he could eat an Ugnaught. Yeah, he could. he's pulled the arms off of a gun. He, he was so, so concerned with saving C-3PO's frame that he didn't care that they were making fun of him. He just wanted to save his buddy. Exactly, and that like it goes to show... And it, it builds the character of Chewbacca in a way that most people, upon first viewing, it wouldn't expect. Like, he is the heart of that relationship, like you said. Like, he is the passion, and he is the one who really, deep down, cares for the people that they're with. And, like, he helps Han to realize that, you know, you didn't have a family when you were a kid. Like, you know, you were an orphan, and we found this out through Solo, but, you know, in the original trilogy... Chewbacca leads him to realize that this is our family now. Like, this is the family that we need. This is the family that we should protect. And that moment with with C-3PO gathering up his parts, almost that whole sequence, you know, gathering up his parts, you know, escaping Bespin with it, and then putting him back together on the Falcon. I mean... As as Goldenrod is... Yelling at him. (laughs) Ripping him a new asshole. Yeah. Like, you fucking idiot. You put my head on backwards. Not not like thank you for saving me, but you're a big dumb idiot. Yeah. 
It's but that's <laughs> just who Goldenrod is. I mean, Goldenrod is one of the biggest assholes in Star Wars. He is. He's just such a dick to so many people. Like, to Chewie, to R2. I'm ba- sh- basically, he, Nick, he's a dick to anyone that can't talk back to him. Exactly. Like, the only people that he's not going <laughs> to talk back to are Luke and Leia. I mean, like, he even did it a little bit to Han. Like, you know. Yeah, but uh, Han's like, yo, fucking yeah, shut him off. Yeah, he's like. What, like, what I'm saying is, like, people that can't speak english or basic yeah. whatever you want to call it he'll he'll dig into him yeah <laughs> like r2 i mean yeah r2 will beat back at him we don't know what he's saying just like chewie will growl back and we don't know what he's saying so c3po takes advantage of that and just starts fucking beating them down down talking to them and ridiculing them <laughs> again anthony daniels at his best Bringing people down who can't talk. Really is. C three PO is one of the biggest jerks in Star Wars. Oh man, what a shame. So my my last moment is actually from TFA, and I can't. I have to look it up, but I can't confirm if it was if it was Peter in the suit at this time. I think it was because in TFA he played Chewie in roles where he didn't have to move. Essentially, where he was stationary, where he was sitting down. So when we see him behind the wheel of the Falcon, when we see him, you know, just kind of sitting about in a scene, it's Peter that's in the suit. And then Junis did all of like the actual physical performance there. So when Kylo gets shot and he's running around like that was Junis. So this one moment is um, is kind of halfway through the film. It is when Chewie is sitting and it's when it's after a battle and he and the nurse is working on him. And the nurse starts asking him questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so the nurse great. starts asking him questions like, you know, oh, you know, like, oh, how did this happen? And he like growls something and she's like, oh, really? And then he goes, oh, you're so brave. <laughs> you know, I just. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, he's like pumping himself up. Yeah. Like he's like bragging to this nurse about the battle that he was just in and how brave he was and. All that he did and just the the way the interaction between those two characters, again, like the way that Peter and even Junis now can take the character of Chewbacca and make these interactions with people that you can understand as comedic and as meaningful as they are is incredible. And this is all all credit to Peter Mayhew and the way that he did this from 1977 on. So that scene is just a perfect representation of like a person who can speak basic, like you said communicating with Chewie but you know what both sides are saying and and you can see in her face like it just goes to show you that even Chewbacca this mighty warrior can be essentially you know looked down upon by by a nurse because of the the way that he's telling a story so I just thought that was another very fun moment with Chewie um and well, yeah, I yeah. mean, if we're sticking on the new stuff, I mean, even TLJ, his his whole arc with the Porgs is fantastic. Yeah, I yeah. mean, that that's not Peter, but I mean, that, that's the character. But I mean, really, Peter, his time with with Chewbacca was, and I like saying that just because of Lando and yeah. stuff like that. You know, Chewbacca, Chewbacca and Han. <laughs> I mean, Land, Land. I I do love that they made a point of of Han correcting young lando when young lando was already calling him hand yeah. and solo yeah that was good i didn't uh, but i mean right didn't he call him like too bad like Chew- chewbacca yeah like he did he, he like called him chewbacca. chewbacca yeah like he just said it differently yep and i even someone that used to dip you, you use chewing tobacco i'd always call it my my chewbacca my, my chewbacca <laughs> like, i gotta get i gotta get me a chewbacca so um i don't yeah. know man it, it, it sucks yeah. like i said i mean yes it, it's a celebrity i mean we shouldn't like stop the world over this but as a as a lifelong star wars fan uh, it, it's a bummer and kind of quoting what one six shooter trevor said in his post it, it's it's not so much these people dying that bums you out. I mean, yes, it is sad because they, they you did look up to them. They did bring joy to your life. Uh, but for, for even people like me, and you know, you're, you're getting older too, it also reminds you that you're not long for this world either. Yeah. You know. when, when you start seeing some of your heroes that you grew up with and, and they're getting old and they're dying and they're just looking raggedy, it definitely has, um, I, you know, I'll be, I'll be 39 this year, and it, it it does remind you that, you know, you're you're approaching that 
back half of life and you know the, the, you're you're going to be coming across a lot more of this type of stuff yeah not just celebrities and people that you you looked up to and that have entertained you but uh, those that are close to you too so i mean it's sometimes a bummer all around when this when this stuff happens yeah so we'll close out this with a couple with a few quotes from from people who knew peter i mean and people who worked with him on star wars so mark hamill was very was very quick to put out you know his response on twitter and it went as such he said he was the gentlest of giants a big man with an even bigger heart who never failed to make me smile and a loyal friend who I love dearly. I'm grateful for the mo- uh, for the memories we shared, and I'm a better man for just having know him. Thanks, Pete. And then um, he added in, you know, hashtag RIP Peter Mayhew, hashtag heartbroken. And then he tagged Peter's official Insta- uh, Twitter handle at the Wookie Roars. Um, so that was Mark's. I like that shot of them on the Empire Hoth set. Yeah, yeah, where he's like. You know, uh, he's got he's the helmet with his head off. Yeah, he's got yeah. the the helmet off on, on the Chewy suit, and he's still got Luke kind of or Mark in a in embrace. That's very, it's very poignant. Like all these the images that are associated with with um, Mark's tweet, they are very emotional. Um, so the the um, quote from Harrison Ford uh, goes like this: He says, "Peter Mayhew was a kind and gentle man." possessed of great dignity and noble character these aspects of his own personality plus his wit and grace he brought to chewbacca we were partners in film and friends in life for over 30 years and i loved him um i mean that's That's pretty nice from Harris. i mean i honestly i don't expect anything like that out of harrison i mean he he's documented to not be a huge fan of star wars universe so it kind of makes me happy that someone in his camp at least took the time to do that yeah i mean if you think about the you know the time that that peter spent on set most of it was with harrison so of course you know over the you know seven years that these movies were being filmed you know they would kind of grow close together um so that was that was very touching and very nice to see harrison or like you said you know somebody associated with harrison put out that that quote for him and then uh finally last one we're going to touch on is jj abrams uh jj was the last star wars director to direct peter mayhew as chewbacca um so he says peter was the loveliest man kind and patient supportive and encouraging a sweetheart to work with and already deeply missed um so clearly i mean you know even like you know from the actors to the to the creators of star wars this this loss is being felt and um it's going to be interesting you know the the character of chewbacca as a whole is in an interesting position now because of us getting towards the end you know with episode nine now we have to start thinking about you know will we see junus back as chewbacca will chewbacca even be a character that sees the big screen again and um well he probably would have if they didn't fuck up Solo's release. That's true. It's very true. So I mean, there. I guess there's potential. I mean, at this point, if they're not going to continue Solo on the big screen, let's hope they may wing it on a Disney Plus season to get some of those stories out. Because we we've, we've said it before. The cast has said it. Ron said it. There was more content planned. Yeah. Yeah. For that Solo crew. I mean, it's it's plain as day. All you have to do is watch the movie. You know, and I even believe the writers said that we're at the kind of the middle middle part of Han and Kira's tale. Yeah. If anything. Yeah, exactly. We still have plenty to go there. I mean, we that movie ended on a fucking cliffhanger. Like pretty much. You know? Yeah, it's basically like, hey, we're gonna go meet up with this crime lord on Tatooine, which could be a movie in and of itself, how Han becomes one of Jabba's lead smugglers and Potentially, we even see his shit that gets the bounty put on his head. Yep. Uh, or, or you could just gone into, you know, how how's Han going to resolve his his deal with Kira? Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's a lot of ground to cover here. And clearly, Chewie would have been heavily involved in that. So, Definitely. I mean, I you never know. I mean, you could hope that one day it, it sees the light of day either on Disney Plus or, or in cinema. But 
it does sound like at this point in time that they've learned from their mistakes of trying to release Star Wars movies too close to each other, and they're probably ever only going to release one Star Wars movie a year moving forward, which is, it is what it is. I mean, the MCU has proven you can release up to three a year, and you're still going to make billions. Yeah. Uh, but you got to do it smartly. Yeah. You have to you have to space them out a little bit, give some time. So we'll see. I mean, I don't I I personally don't think Chewbacca is gone from the live action screen. Yeah. And after 9 at least. Yeah, hopefully we see him back on the screen again. Um so yeah, uh definitely sad news coming out of Star Wars, you know, Star Wars universe this week, but you know, as we must do, we move on. And we move on to some May the 4th news. So, Matt, you yeah, know. Yeah, some, some little stuff. I mean, yeah. there's obviously a lot of other May the 4th news, but it's useless talking about on May the 3rd, especially when this is going to probably come out on May the 6th or 7th. Yep. So a lot of the deals will already have been passed. I mean, if you want me to remind you on shit you've missed, there's a ton or there was a ton of Star Wars video game sales. There's one that kind of kicked me to my nuts because literally – a week or two ago, I finally was like, you know what? I feel like playing Knights of the Old Republic again. It's used heavily in Swago. I just want to get reimmersed in the narrative. Let me try it out. Uh, should I play it on my old disc and just use the up res version on Xbox One X? That could be kind of cool. But I'm like, you know what? I kind of want a portable version. I'm going to shell out the 10 bucks to buy the mobile version of KOTOR. So I do that. And then this week, literally a day ago, I get the announcement that, hey, by the way, it's going to be marked down to four ninety nine. <laughs> it's funny that you're playing it. You bought it because I actually started playing it on my phone, too. Like I started playing it probably. Haven't you? You've played the mobile version before, though, right? Yeah, I have. Yeah, uh, that's what I thought. Like, I, I remember you saying that it, it's pretty damn competent. And, and honestly, I know Bioware didn't fully make the mobile version. It's it, it's Aspire, but. In terms of visual quality, I, I think the mobile version looks even better than the you know the sixteen twenty time up res that you could get on the Xbox One X if you throw in the Xbox version. Yeah, exactly. Like it looks fantastic for like you said a fucking older game, like a game that came right. out in the early. Just, I mean, the controls are a bit wonky. You got to like drag your finger and shit. But so far, I I, I love having Kotar mobile, but. That's not the point. The point is, if you're listening to this now and you're going, oh, shit, Star Wars game sales, you've already missed them. <laughs> but there was a ton. I mean, I'm talking upwards of close to probably 100 Star Wars games marked down significantly across consoles and PC. Yeah. But the one thing we do want to talk about that was uh, kind of announced for May the 4th, and it should still be around by the time you're listening, is that for the first time, Razer, you know, the computer hardware people... Uh, they've partnered with, um, I'm assuming, Lucasfilm, Disney, whoever, to get the license here, but they, they have a new line of literally trademarked Star Wars Stormtrooper Edition PC gaming peripherals, and there's three. You can get a uh, mechanical Black Widow silent mechanical. Well, I already said mechanical, so <laughs> you, you got that part. Anyways, it's it's fucking mechanical keyboard, Stormtrooper Edition. We're, we're talking uh, 100 bucks for that. You can get a Razer Atheris wireless mouse Stormtrooper Edition. I really dig the mouse. I love the graphics on it. it that, that's retail for 60 And then there's also a Goliathus, not just Goliath, but Goliathus, extended gaming mouse mat. And, Nick, you, you would almost have to explain this to me. I don't do a lot of PC gaming, but I guess these days it's beneficial to have a super mouse long. mat that's literally the probably longer or wider in, in length than your keyboard. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, I, I used to play competitive Counter Strike Source back in the day. Is that just because you gotta like sh you gotta like do yeah. wider swaths or sweeps? Yep. Yep, you have to basically what you want to do is your aim is to pick your mouse up off of the pad as little as possible so the wider your mouse pad is the the less you have to do that so that's why we have these extra extended yeah, yeah. long mouse pads right. now so th so this one i mean the, the specialty here and the reason we're talking is because it's got some pretty cool looking stormtrooper graphics on it. yeah so i mean you I mean, if you're into star wars and you, you need some new gaming peripherals and you're a big fan of razor who you know, clearly makes some top-notch shit 
uh, they, these are pretty cool, and, and and they are legit. I mean, it just again, they just have the skins on it. They're they're still gonna have the Razor Tech in there, uh, but they're offering a deal right now, limited time. If you buy all three, you can essentially save ten percent off the bundle. Yeah. So what would uh, be? So we got the links in there, and Nick will link to it in the post if you're listening through through StarWarsTime.net. But yeah, we got the deets. Yeah, Matt. It, I mean, like you liking the the Imperial aesthetic, especially with this keyboard, because I know you rock the Mac stuff, and the Mac sticks right. with like. You know the white, gray, black. Oh, it's kind all of... flat. I mean, my, my keyboard, like it, it's so flat, I could shove it up my ass crack. Yeah, dude, you you might want to swoop in and pick up this uh, this stormtrooper no keyboard. Way. It's got a cable on it. <laughs> There's no fucking way. I mean, I I don't need that type of response time. I'm not gaming on my computer. That's so. true. That's true. Yeah. What, what I would get, and I still wouldn't get it because I prefer a trackpad these days. Yeah. Is the mouse? I mean, the, the the fucking mouse is tits. Yeah, it looks. I, mean, really I, cool. I love this. I mean, it's literally you're holding a stormtrooper's head in your hand. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty fucking cool looking. So it's awesome. Um, so, I mean, I, I would definitely whip the mouse yeah. if I had a spare 60 laying around. And then if we so if we talk about Razor and Star Wars a little bit, this isn't the first time that they've cro- that they've crossed over with them so when Star Wars: The Old Republic MMO came out, the online game, they actually did a line. That's similar to this. That was similar to this. They did a headset release. They did a mouse release. I have the mouse, actually. And they did a keyboard release. And I really still want that keyboard because it has our Besh keys on it. Oh, yeah. See, I could get into that. So it's like... I mean, that, that's just different. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I wouldn't know what the fuck it meant, but it, it would look cool than just having, you know, your, your, your typical... A, B, C, D, whatever keyboard. Yeah, I mean, this thing, I mean, obviously you can't get it anymore because it was limited run. It only came out, you know, at the time. Oh, that's what the black market exists for, man. Exactly. Overpay for it on eBay. Yeah, I need to find it because this keyboard is fucking amazing. I mean, some of the shit on there, if you don't play Star Wars The Old Republic, you won't need because there's like specific keys that are bound oh, yeah, I bet. to specific it's probably, things. It probably has like its own built-in hot keys. So they're not even technically hot keys. They're just fucking keys. Yeah, but they also have... So the keyboard has a trackpad built into it for, you know, for your sake. And um, <laughs> in like it has, like I said, it's got the English keys on it. So you can see what you're typing in English, but it also has the Auerbesh keys on it. I, I still, man, I can't... I respect <laughs> PC gamers have at it. You guys want to spend the money to have the best at all times. I I get it 100%. Yeah. I mean, I, I love my, my technology. I love my gadgets. I'm just not trying to fuck around with installing shit. It may not work. I got to patch this. <laughs> I got to fucking use WASD to fucking walk. Fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> fuck WASD. Fuck keyboards for gaming. Oh man, I give love me that. a goddamn controller Oof. any fucking day. As a, as I don't <laughs> care about the precision. I don't care about how quick you can aim or how much better it is. Fuck <laughs> that. Just give me a caveman style controller with joysticks so I can move my dude around and shoot without getting fucking my brain tangled up in knots trying to figure out keys on a key. <laughs> oh, I don't man. get it. I, I, yeah. I fucking hate it. I hate that setup. I understand. I totally get it. I totally get it. I, yeah, I'm just, I, I, I don't know. Like that was, that was my first thing. PC game. I remember building a PC when I was like 16 years old, PC gaming, playing Counter-Strike Source at a pretty damn high level for a long time. It is, it's just it's a byproduct of, of our generational differences. Yeah, I mean when 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 PC gaming was really starting to get legit, I was mid to late high school college. All I cared about was what college age boys care about. Yep, and that's your penis. <laughs> that's it. Oh man, penis See. drinking drugs. I mean that that's what I was worried about. Not. Ooh, I can play the best looking video games if I pay attention on my computer. I was like, yeah, fuck it. Yep. I'll buy an Xbox, use a controller that's the size of my head. I mean, really, you guys remember the original Xbox controller, the oh brick? My God. I mean, it's it, it's like it should be put into the gaming hall of fame at some point in time just because of its design. Yeah, it's the ridiculously It, it could have <laughs> I I'm not kidding. I think it almost weighed 10 pounds. Oh, God. And it was 
probably half a foot wide. Yeah. <laughs> when you, I mean, you couldn't even, you almost couldn't even hold it with two hands. Yeah. It was ridiculous, dude. So th- that's the type of gaming I was doing during those days when, when PC gaming really started to, to take off. And I mean, I obviously, I did a lot of PC gaming. I mean, Rebel Assault, a lot of the early Star Wars games I was doing on PC. But I just never, I could never get into the fucking keyboard and, and mouse setup. Yeah. It's it's a no. little difficult. No. but uh, Even when I was playing, like, X-Wing or TIE Fighter, I had to, like, get one of the old school joysticks, like, fucking flight sticks yeah <laughs> so you were using the flight stick and said okay fuck okay. yeah dude and those games in my opinion are some of the best oh, yeah. i mean don't get me wrong there there's some star wars games some of my favorite star wars games are pc i mean star wars galactic battlegrounds in my opinion is hands down the greatest real-time strategy base building attacking game ever yeah uh, i like it even better than empire at war i mean empire at war was kind of a more polished True to life version where Galactic Battleground had a more cartoony look to it, but it, it had the. It was very StarCraft 1. You know, here's your factions. Each faction has a campaign. Each campaign tells a little story. It was just a blast. I mean, I fucking love the game. I bought it years ago through one of the bundles on Steam. Have yet to play it again, but the fact that I know that I own it is all that matters, and that's because of how much I loved it. So. The point is, Nick, I'm not shitting on PC games, PC Star Wars games. I just, I hate the mouse. gaming on a PC. If it's not an RTS, something like that makes sense for a mouse and keyboard. Yeah. I mean, to me, RTS, uh, turn-based games, f- sure, make complete sense for keyboard and mouse. When we're talking, like, platformers, third-person action games, or first-person shooters, f- Go fuck yourself with those keyboards. I can understand it. I can understand it. By the way, for those people who know about the SWOTOR key, uh, the SWOTOR keyboard, I looked it up. There is only one for sale that I can find. How it's much are they jobbing you guys? Five hundred and twenty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and this is used. I love the black market. This is used. Fuck yeah, like, man. Used five hundred and twenty bucks. The the seller does have a hundred percent positive feedback. Um, but it's coming from Bulgaria. <laughs> it's there you go. coming there from. You go. It's coming from Plovdiv, Bulgaria. So oh, totally. yeah, totally. I'd buy that. <laughs> so I'm if sure you, the shipping's real cheap. Yeah. So if you um, if you want the Swotor keyboard, I mean, dude, that that's just that's the epitome of collecting. Yeah. It, it all comes down to supply and demand and how much is another collector willing to pay exactly because like i because i doubt that price was just randomly thrown out i I bet there was other units that moved for around that price oh yeah and like i said dude like there were a lot of these keyboards sold like people who are you know hear about swotor now and are like oh that game's dead like when this game came out it came out big like they had a million people playing this game at one time like like a legit like you couldn't get into the servers there were so many people playing it and like these items from razor flew off the fucking shelf so um keep that in mind when you're thinking about you know trying to find one of these because they're damn near fucking impossible to find um but yeah so if you are a fan of razor if you are a gamer pc gamer you like having pc cool pc peripherals go to razor i will link the post like matt said in the podcast post so you can go straight to that um that order uh page from razor and uh pick yourself up some dope looking peripherals especially if you need a super long mouse pad this goliath is like almost the size <laughs> yeah. of your whole desk apparently those are a thing as nick as nick has explained yeah so next up matt another piece from you about the june smugglers box star wars yeah, just just a quick one yeah. here i mean I, i'm telling you guys right now i mean my, my funko pop love is fading fast uh that was validated at star wars celebration 19 in chicago here a few weeks ago when i literally had passes to get into the funko vip line and i didn't care to use them uh but if you watch, if you pay attention to Star Wars Time Show, StarWarsTime.net, you would notice that this week I put out an unboxing video of, lo and behold, a Funko Star Wars Smuggler's Bounty box. So, I'm not completely over it, which is why we covered this piece. It's just really, real quick fandom stuff here. But if you are still in the Funko, 
and love getting yourself some exclusive Funko Pops or other exclusive Funko products, the theme for the June 2019 Funko Smuggler's Bounty Box has been revealed, and it's a good one, and it is Darth Vader. So that means come July, those that order from Amazon, which you can do through our link on StarWarsTime.net, you will be getting a box with exclusive collectibles all themed around our boy DV. So it has potential to be a good box, if anything else, Nick. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you pointed out um, on Cast Pass that some of the best pops out there are Vader pops. Um, oh, yeah, 100%. Once they got a little modernized, I mean, I have the original Vader where it was – they're still using like the little beady eyes and not trying to fully recreate his helmet. Now they are, and those are just money. I mean, if I ever do just mass sell my pop collection, which is 700 strong, people, anybody, <laughs> I'm, I'm listening, I'm, I'm open to offers, I would, I would probably keep my Vader ones for sure. Yeah, yeah, they look incredible. I have a, a, a Funko Vader and really enjoy the way it looks too, so... Uh, good stuff here. If you're into the subscription boxes like I used to be, I used to have a subscription to the Firefly Loot Crate um, that I recently canceled because apparently there's some sort of like distribution problem with that box. But, I mean, if you want one that's Star Wars focused, I mean, here you go. Star Wars Bounty Box changes the theme every month. So you can move from Vader. Yeah, they're to every, they come out every two. It's handled mm -hmm. through Amazon now. I mean, if you're someone that used to do it when Funko handled it, it, it has changed a bit. But, I mean, Amazon makes it easy. You can sign up for a subscription or just buy per box. They're going to be 30 bucks a pop, and you're usually going to get around $50 worth of shit in it. Yeah. And sometimes it is just shit in it. But it's fifty dollars worth of shit. Yeah. So if you have a bookshelf where you keep little trinkets on it, yeah. you know, or yeah, that the Nick's dead on. This is these are boxes that just come with shit. Yeah. To just randomly display on random shit in your house. Exactly. I have a whole bookshelf behind me that <laughs> literally has five books on it, but it has probably it's got two lightsabers. It's got a Harry Potter wand on it. It's got. A ton of Firefly figurines on it from my Loot Crate subscription. It's, what else does it have? It has my Dishonored 2 pre-order yeah, special right, exactly. edition mask. Like bull bullshit you probably picked up from PAX or something. Yeah, so th there's it's perfect for stuff that, like that's that. That's all these little crates are. They're just literally knick-knacky bullshit that you'd get at a convention yeah. for free. Um, so yeah, so if you're looking for that, like Matt said, I'll have the post linked in the podcast and you can go straight to the Amazon page, pre-order it, or pick it up. Um, outside of the pre-order once they release it in June. Uh, last official piece, written piece, that we have to talk right. about here is another bit of Mark Hamill fun. So as we it's all our know... buddy Mark here. Uh, Mark Hamill is a master and a joker on Twitter, and he took to Twitter probably a week ago, and he... he yeah, it's, it's the 26th, is April 26th is when he put this out. Yes. Yeah, so. It's not a graphic he cooked up. It looks like it comes from or, or whoever put their tag on it, at Stephen Wayne Art. Yeah. And what it is is an image of all of the original trilogy Photoshop cast yeah. image of, of, the, of, the, of the original cast. Yeah, so it's all of them cut out. So we see, the, you know, Billy D. Lando from the uh, Rise of Skywalker trailer. We see... Old Han, we see um, Carrie Fisher from TFA, and then we also see what looks like a behind-the-scenes image of Luke uh, or of Mark in his TLJ outfit. Luke, Luke was not smiling. No, in the Last Jedi, I do all. not think that there was a single smile. So they're all there on the bridge of the Falcon, and the image that was cropped up by this Stephen Wayne art person you know, has a tag in the bottom. It says star Wars. And then the subtitle is what should have been. Okay. Kind of a sigh there. And then Hamill retweeted the picture, oh, not even retweeted. Fuck. He just posted it. And he said, the only thing he said was hashtag missed opportunities. Uh -huh. <laughs> and this, this lit it ablaze. Like when Mark Hamill does something like this, you know, the internet, I mean, it, it got 130,000 likes and 31,000 comments. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, it blew the fuck up. I mean, so what do you think it did, people? And why? I mean, the only reason I posted this again, we brought this up before. It's just, I, I know what Mark's doing. This entertains him. Yeah. I get that on some level. 
but it, 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 on another level, I'm just like, dude, you're, you you know the state of Star Wars fandom right now. You know you're a Jesus Christ figure in Star Wars fandom. So why do you keep giving the the far alt right of Star Wars shit to chew on? Yeah. And that's all that this does. He did come back and say, hey, I just saw this pic and I posted because I missed them. Nothing more, nothing less. And and maybe that's true, but it's not because he put the fucking hashtag in there, missed opportunities. Yeah. So, I mean, he's not being completely honest in his sort of apology follow-up. Yeah. Uh, But he even comes in and says, maybe I should have just post a bunch of end, end game spoilers so it, when it comes down to it he does this for entertainment yeah like he's he does it to entertain himself but in the end i i just i i don't quite appreciate it because of the fuel he is giving to the fuck-ups yeah yeah it's definitely a slippery slope when you're trying to do stuff like this it's just and, like Mark, just leave it alone, bro. We, we, I get it. I respect you. May have loved to have been in a scene with all of your former castmates. I get that. Yes, it would have been fantastic. But hey, man, it ain't happening. In the end, this trilogy was never about you guys, anyways. Yeah. So it wasn't. I mean, that's what a lot of people need to understand. It, it never did Disney come out and say, "Hey, we're we're making a trilogy." For the old people. It was always, no, we're doing this with the old people to prop up the new people. Yeah. Plain and simple. That's what it is. So, uh, yeah. Love it or hate it, it just, I don't know, it's just like, Mark, come on, man. Just let it go. Yeah. I mean, if it was, if we were in like a post-TFA Star Wars fandom, then I could see like him having fun Of course, fun yeah, that, that's like, like that. fun fucking around. Yeah. But, you can't have fun and fuck around Star Wars anymore because of what happened with TLJ. Exactly. So it's it sucks, but that's that's the state of Star Wars fandom now. Yeah. So it's just Mark up to his shenanigans again. And when, like you said, when he responded to the post, you know, he reposted the image again, except he added in a little Joker, like an and no, it, his son did it. Oh, well, Nathan look did. Look at the fucking yeah. yeah look, did. he he. It's his fucking kid threw in his Joker thing. Yeah, his Joker holding a green. Basically lightsaber. highlighting like, yeah, my dad likes to be evil. Yeah, so and have fun. So there, there, there you go. So that's that's Hamill on Twitter. That was his firestorm of the week. Follow him on Twitter because Mark does. He does oh, it's post always fun. fun. Yeah. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I love Mark. I mean, I, I'm not like angry or anything. All I'm saying is like, for a guy that's so anti stirring shit on social media especially when it comes to politics like if you follow mark you know exactly where he lies yeah and he calls out people for essentially doing what he's doing yeah so like he's literally trolling people he has some cognitive dissonance which, when it comes to star wars though. right i mean he he's trolling star wars fans because he knows he can get them riled up Yet he gets riled up when people like the president troll people on Twitter. Yeah. What I do. It's like, man, I, I, I get it, man. It's not even close. Like, what Mark's doing is not even close to what the president's doing, but it is still kind of the same thing. Yeah. So, uh, very interesting day in Twitter was April 26th. But, you know, nothing. It's nothing too, you know, it sucks to see something like that and, and know that there yeah, are going to have Nick and I aren't getting all like on our high horses yeah. shitting on Mark here. We, we just wanted to bring it up because it, it definitely got some play in Star Wars yeah. land this week. And and that's our our main objective of the Star Wars Time Friday show is to cover stuff that pops up in Star Wars land. And this is definitely something that got play. Yeah, it got play. So it, but we're, that's we're, it. I'm not trying to sit here and say I'm this fucking holier than now <laughs> motherfucker. I, I, just listen to the way I talk. Yeah. <laughs> you, you understand that I am very far from being a righteous person. Yeah. He's the Sith. If you've ever looked at our logo, yeah. which our logo is dope right. as fuck, by the way. So if you've, if you've only listened, and it's an, the best part is Nick, it's animated. And my kid knows exactly who I am. <laughs> he's like, daddy. And it's daddy. not like our, our images really even look that different. I mean, your guy has glasses and I believe your eye ring. Yeah. But outside of that, you could argue it's pretty much the same face. Yeah. You could flip them. She still knows. Like she goes, that's my daddy. <laughs> Essentially, the one that looks like a psycho. <laughs> yeah, you're the Sith. You got the red lightsaber. <laughs> I mean, I have to say that our logo is probably the best Star Wars podcast logo on the market. So if you're That's listening great. to us, 
Make sure to right. jump over Star Just, Wars. Hey, Prime. if net. anything, rate our fucking logo because the more ratings we get, the higher it's going to come up in that iTunes search, and the more people will be able to look at it. And we we may suck to listen to, but we may be cool to look at at least in a, a, a from a logo perspective. I will say that you know our logo and our site are very aesthetically pleasing. Damn Skippy bitches. Yeah, very. Get on it. All right, dude. So uh, this isn't anything we kind of posted throughout the week it's something that's kind of been on my mind because they they kind of live within the same license holder these days uh they're handled by the same company and honestly i've literally seen this movie four times within a week uh so i i just wanted to, i i kind of flowed this out to nick earlier and this isn't going to be a long subject it's just something i i kind of want to put out there for people to think about but i've now seen avengers endgame four times in a week's time, literally, I saw it last Thursday night, last Friday, and then this week I saw it Thursday night and again Friday. Uh, why do I do that? I, I don't quite know. I mean, a lot of it is because I am an AMC Stubbs A-list subscriber, so literally I can see as many movies as I want, or at least three ti- three movies a week for 20 bucks a month, so why not? Yep. Uh, but Endgame, it's just one of those movies, at least to me, where anytime I'm watching it, I feel like I'm around friends and family as odd as that sounds it brings a certain level of comfortness to me i feel comforted watching this film and and that's why i've watched it so many times but it's also just a damn good movie so the point is here the, the 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 point i was making to nick is i gave the i gave endgame a 10 out of a 10 yeah. You could argue it's probably not perfect. 10 out of 10, in my opinion, doesn't imply that it is perfect. But to me, it's a 10 out of 10 type of movie. So it's damn good. But more importantly to me, the fact that this movie, film 22 of 21, more than capably, if not perfectly, was able to wrap up 21 films worth of narratives, individual narratives, co-narratives, joint narratives, whatever you want to call it, throughout those 21 movies before Endgame. It wrapped them up and paid off, in my opinion, on fan expectations and fan service better than anything I've ever seen in the geek space. Right, Nick? A hundred percent. I saw the movie on Saturday last weekend, and you told me going into it, you're like, I gave it a 10. Let me know what you think when you come out. And I, I texted Matt after I came out, and I was like, I think it's perfect too. I cried twice. Like I don't cry in movies often. Like the last time I cried in a theater was Star Wars, uh, The Force Awakens. Like I, I cried because Star Wars was back. The next time I cried in theaters was this movie two times. And like, you're right. The threads that it was able to tie and the way that they, the Russo brothers w- were able to tie them together was damn near perfect bro i mean they they folded in a character from fucking the agent carter tv series on abc yeah exactly like we're covering stuff here that oh, re- spo- uh, end game spoilers just in case by the way yeah yeah I mean, we haven't said any yet but just in case yeah so just yeah if you haven't seen end game yet which at this point i'm looking at the worldwide box office of it so far yeah. 1.78 billion yet, dollars. You don't care. Yeah, you don't fucking care. Like, Let, let's be real. You're not gonna see it, or anyway. So one point. In, in anyways, Disney <laughs> is they're, they're breaking their spoiler embargo on Monday anyway. So this will be out on Tuesday. It doesn't fucking matter. Yeah. But point is, Nick, is as you kind of agree, is this th- this movie just? I mean, it nailed it. it. I mean, I I don't go to movies four times just because I have nothing to do in life. All right, let, let's get that out there. I go because it entertains me. And yes, screening four didn't quite impact me as much as screening one. But yes, the emotions were still there, which proves to me that this is a fantastic film. So why are we talking about a Marvel movie on a Star Wars podcast? Here, Here's the connection, my friends. So we've heard it. We've, we've discussed it. J.J. has made a point to say, Kathleen has made a point to say, Disney has made a point to say that Episode Nine, The Rise of Skywalker, its main function, its main charge, is not only to be a good movie in and of itself, but more importantly, its goal is to fundamentally and cohesively wrap up Episodes 1 through 8. 
So what I was just kind of saying to Nick, like when we consider what Disney, Marvel, Feige, the Russos, and the cast and crew were able to do with Endgame, they better, they better reach as high, if not higher, and I'm talking the Star Wars production, Episode Nine. It better reach as high, if not higher, and pay off as high, if not higher, than what Endgame did. Yeah, I mean... For me personally, I mean, me being a a Star Wars fan from birth, an MCU fan from 2008, diehard MCU. I mean, diehard. Fucking love the MCU. I'm not a comic book reader. I've always loved comic books, just never really read them. But the MCU is what has sold me on all things Marvel and what they put out. So, with that being said, I'm still, you know, I love you 3,000 times more a Star Wars fan than MCU. So, Nick, do you think and do you expect, do you have the same expectations, the level expectations as I do for Rise now that we've seen what Endgame was able to do for 21 movies. Yeah, so I think that it was... 21 movies versus 8, people. 21 versus 8. I think that... Now, sorry, Nick, but real quick. I mean, Star Wars obviously has spanned decades, so uh, that kind of makes up for the lack of number of films, I believe, Nick. I mean, you have multiple generations mixed up in this, multiple decades, 40-plus years... So th- that that does give a little more uh, a little more weight and probably a bigger challenge to JJ to wrap all this up because you know and again th- th- this this franchise started in the middle of the goddamn thing yeah four five six then one two three now seven eight nine so it didn't benefit from a, a chronology not that the MCU is even in chronological order technically based on when they release but dude I mean. Do you have the same expectations? Are you going to hold rise to the same expectations now that you know that it's possible to literally make a near-perfect movie that its main goal is to essentially wrap up 21 other movies? I think that's the important qualifier is before seeing Endgame, I had high expectations for Rise of Skywalker anyway. I mean, like, we knew... Of course, because Jay this JJ saying like we're wrapping up eight films like this was before Endgame dropped. Right. See, I mean, those expectations, as Nick said, were set during celebration. I mean, everyone involved said, "Yo, this not only has to be a good movie, this has to fundamentally and hopefully expertly tie up all this shit." Yeah. So I, I'm definitely looking for this level of film, for an endgame level of film out of J.J., Chris Terrio, and Lucasfilm. I think that they've already moved in the right direction. I think bringing Palpatine back, in doing that, they've correctly identified the task in front of them. to In order to wrap up eight movies that have played out the way that they have, you have to bring back Palpatine he is a necessary part of this ending um what else is in front of them is very difficult because like you said the movies themselves in terms of production and release span decades but also if you look at the time period that spanned between the movies themselves within the universe is is also across decades um if we look at the Avengers and we look at the MCU, if you start, even if you if you were to order them chronologically, the sequence of events plays out pretty straightforward. You don't have any massive gaps in between. Like you don't have a twenty year gap like we have between episodes three and four in 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 the Avengers and the MCU. Like that that time period with no content just doesn't exist. At least no big screen content doesn't exist. Um, so not only are you wrapping up, a you know, multiple decades worth of production, you're also wrapping up multiple decades worth of storytelling and across multiple 
different generations of characters like you mentioned that again with the mcu we're wrapping up 21 films but within those 21 films the generational gap between the characters is very small like we were introduced to what is going to be the torch carriers for the mcu dr strange captain marvel black panther relatively you know recently whereas if you look at star wars you have specific generational characters that are separated by a long period of time within the universe. So that is a completely different challenge, I think, than even the Russo brothers have had to do with the 21 movies. The amount of content undoubtedly leans towards the Russo brothers and what they did with Endgame. 21 distinct films, 21 storylines that played out in their individual movies, but also it's had insane. ends I mean, it's, to it's tie it up. It's literally insane. Yeah, it's fucking crazy. The way that they were able to do that expertly and literally like I got out of that film and I told my girlfriend, I, I was like, I don't I can't identify one thing that could have done better. Like I cannot think of a single thing that they could have done better. And then after again, we preface this with spoilers after thinking about it, the only thing that I could think of that I would have added in there is at the end when we're at Tony's funeral and we're showing everybody, and Nick Fury walks in, I wanted to see Coulson walk in, too. That would... Well, you can't, though, based on Marvel TV, and now, I mean, it is clearly looped in, because Coulson's gone. Oh, I mean, yeah. I mean, Coulson, I mean, in the last like if, it, season of, of... He's gone. Yeah, but then also in the trailer, we see he's back. <laughs> so Yeah, like, but he's not, that's not Coulson, though. That's a bad guy i know that's well basically looks like him i know it's gonna be for, for now though at least that's what we know. yeah that's what we've been sold I, I know what you're saying but i i do believe that's based it. on the way the stories have been told there's no way colson could have appeared there. yeah i know that's I, like after i thought about yeah i, was I mean like, he he was i mean outside of this the stinger at the end of iron man one where you, you got fury i mean Coulson probably interacted with tony more than any shield member exactly early so, on so it it I mean, it was an unfortunate turn of events the way that the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. series played out and they played his story out that way because I think that would have been super good to see the person who essentially was the one who brought Tony Stark into this whole thing be there at his funeral. But, you know, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. has its own story to tell. Like you said, from what we can tell in the trailers, Coulson or what looks like Coulson is, is back, but is a bad guy. And it may not even really be Coulson who knows, but that was the only thing that I could identify with star Wars. It's so hard because I've put out a theory around Anakin. I really do think that the involvement of that character in some form or fashion is needed in order to wrap up the nine films. Oh, dude, I, I think you're spot on. And I, I think it's, it's a foregone conclusion. Yeah. I, I just I don't know what version we'll get if we're gonna get An you know Hayden Anakin, half Vader half Anakin, something. But I, I I do I do agree with you. I mean if we're talking we got to sum up all eight movies. You can't do it without Anakin coming into play. Yeah, and then you can't. It's it's odd because then you get into these weird you know. In my opinion, Obi Wan can be left out. Like in my opinion, yeah, for I don't nine, care about uh, Obi Wan is irrelevant. Yeah, like Obi's story. Obi Wan's always been a a side player. I mean, he's been one that he's been there to help at certain points, but it's never been about Obi Wan. Yeah, like Obi's it's always been about the Skywalkers. Obi's thread wrapped when Anakin redeemed himself at the end of Episode Six. So there's no there's no reason to bring Obi back. And especially since it's now been, you know, put out there that the, the, the real true mentor to Luke is, is Yoda, Grandmaster Yoda, like we saw in TLJ. Like that is that is Luke's direct contact. That is his mentor, his go to. So we don't need Obi-Wan back in any form or fashion. Um, it's 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 a difficult, difficult task in front of JJ and Chris and Kathleen and and everybody involved well, in i guess so, so what i want to ask you is what are you gonna do if rise doesn't resonate with you the way endgame does that's such a hard question 
It's going to be, I, I mean, people like us going into our first screen of Rise, it's going to be impossible not to be an emotional mess. Yeah, exactly. I, I guess the question is, like, what if when the dust settles and you're sitting here and you go, like, yeah, this didn't quite. I mean, because to me, I know Endgame is magic and it's going to be magic forever because there are. There are moments just like in the original trilogy I can pick out where I know it's going to work me over a bit. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I know the moments where it's going to... I mean, even, even four fucking screenings in within a week. I mean, 12 hours of this movie within seven days' time. There are still certain moments even today where, I mean, it didn't hit me as hard as it did screening one or two, where I still was like, ooh, yeah, okay, yes. This is a very well-done piece of cinema. Yeah, exactly. And, like... It's, I mean, I, I, that's really the whole crux of me even bringing this topic up for discussion is Endgame pulled it off with a, a in my opinion, a much larger scope in terms of narrative sewing. Uh, yes, it had the benefit of having thing, everything kind of recent in, in everyone's memory. And real no major fucking divisiveness, right? I mean, that's one thing the MCU has benefited from. I mean, yeah, everyone's like, oh, yeah, Thor 2 is pretty fucking dumb. But in the end, it's not a bad movie. It, it's still a good movie. I mean, it's not trash. Yeah. It's not a prequel. Right? <laughs> yeah. All right? We, we can agree that even the worst MCU film, if you want to throw out Incredible Hulk, it's still not on the level of an uh, Attack of the Clones. No, no. So I guess that, like... For me, if it if if I come out of Rise and I'm not feeling Endgame, I, I need to I need to be crying the entire runtime of Rise is what I'm coming to realize. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I need. I need to literally be so emotionally destroyed that I'm gonna have to see it four times just to get the whole movie in. Yeah, to me, the the real level that I'm setting it to is I have to feel the same way coming out of Rise as I did when I was coming out of the force awakens because in like probably three, four podcasts ago, we were going over like, well, what's your favorite star Wars movie? And I said that I can make a legitimate argument that my favorite is the force awakens because of the way that it made me feel in the, in the theaters because of the emotions yeah, that it brought out with point. me. So like I need to feel that for sure. Um, the end game thing is so like, I definitely want to make that, that, that link between these two films, but I'm almost like afraid to, because this movie, like you said, it seems perfect. Like, can you have something live up to this level of perfection? I, I do think episode nine of the sky wars, sky wars. <laughs> yeah. Sky Wars, <laughs> du, 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 du. Wars in the motherfucking sky. All right, whatever. Skywalkers. I mean, even though it's going to be a, a, a nine-film saga, just the history to it, the fandom to it, which is still ten times more rabid than even MCU fandom. Oh, yeah. Hell, even probably Marvel fandom overall. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't really think you have a Marvel celebration every year, do you? No, I mean... The, the, I mean, you have, you have SDCC, but that, that you know that's everything. Yeah, that's the closest. Uh, I do think the, the just the... The history behind Star Wars, the fandom behind the Skywalker saga, even though it's not 21 movies, it still has the same weight and scope to it. Yeah. Because of, of the history. Yeah. And, oh man, it's... I I do. So, right? yeah, it's, getting it's, down to it, I do expect it's fucking... It's tough to think about. I, like, I can expect... It, can it do it? I think it can. I think it can. Because J.J. fucking made it happen... And he's back. Like, J.J. made Star Wars happen again in a way that nobody thought possible. Let's be real. Like, when The Force Awakens was announced, people were apprehensive. Like, there were people like me and Matt who we were pumped out of our minds. Like, we were ready. We, we, we had such a long time with no Star Wars. But then we walked into that theater, and it was beautiful. And it was everything that we could ever want a revival of Star Wars to be. And it showed out in the box office in a way that that made Disney say, you know what, we're going to build a billion dollar park in D in Florida <laughs> much, and California. We're going to fucking we're going to make movies until we can we run out of ideas. And 
he made it happen. So if there is one person on this planet that I want in charge of the final Skywalker film, it's J.J. Abrams. Yeah. Like, he, he, and I do, I do. I mean, again, I, I just kind of threw this out there for conversation. I do believe J.J. and his cast and crew are going to pay off on it. Yeah. And I am expecting my first screening of The Rise of Skywalker to be an emotional mess. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, but I want that. I mean, because that's I mean, Endgame, and I want it to be three hours long. That's the other thing I want. Like, bring it the fuck on. Like, if anything, Endgame's numbers, box office wise, should dispel any bullshit about movies being too long. Yeah, I mean, especially geeky or sci-fi shit. I mean, they've proven that a three-plus-hour movie can make a billion dollars in a weekend worldwide. Yeah, I mean, billion. It's- in a weekend, one point seven eight. Get the fuck billion. out of here! It's fucking JJ. Crazy. Don't hesitate. Don't feel bad. Trust me, your fans will not care if this is a four-hour movie. If you if you leave in just random bullshit scenes, we will not care. And and here's the thing: is go for three hours if you feel like you have to to tell the story the right way. And I'm glad that you made the distinction that these are the same license holders because he's not going to be held back. Like, if they let the Russo brothers go three hours with Endgame, nobody's telling JJ, "Whoa, pump the brakes! Exactly. You're at 2:35." Like, they're gonna let him go. If he wants to go, they will let him go, and they'll encourage him to go because now I really think that because of the way that Endgame blew up. This helps. Oh, the, rise. yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. That's what I was saying. It's yeah. like, it's it's proven now, people. You can have a three-hour movie about fake nonsense, and people will come to it in droves, and some idiots will see it four times in a week. Oh yeah, absolutely. And like, look, let me give you so like a breakdown in terms of numbers. It's still kind of. I'm curious to see what what Endgame's weekend two numbers are going to look like because they're domestic right now sitting at 473 million this is one week after one week of release the- dude i i don't think it's going to lose its number one spot for the month of may i mean maybe pikachu knocks it next week just because it's a pokemon bullshit nah I'm, I doubt it. What I'm and then wondering, the week after that, you got John Wick 3, but I still doubt it because that's going to be rated R. It's going to be limited in terms of who can see it. Yep. I, I, don't, I don't see a movie on the horizon outside of maybe Lion King in, in June that, possibly <laughs> knocking Endgame out of the number one spot. Do you think... Dude, my, my theater by me, I'm not kidding, today probably has... 50 screenings still. Oh, yeah, dude. The, the screening numbers are crazy. Like they, they start at 9 in the morning. I've never seen this theater start showing movies at 9 in the morning. They're still shown at 9 in the morning a week later. Yeah. So here's my question. Foreign, it's not even close. Like, Foreign Endgame has already beat The Force Awakens. Um, do you think that Endgame will beat the domestic total of Force Awakens? Force Awakens domestic total is... Is oh, 936 dude, it, million. At this point, the question is, is Endgame finally going to topple Avatar? That's that's the question I'm asking. Yeah. As the highest grossing box office movie of all time, Avatar, Avatar is still in the number one spot, and there's reasons for that. I mean, I believe it was in theaters for almost a year, which you're, you're never going to get in this day and age. You're never going to get a movie... Even a, even end game size staying in theaters for probably more than six months, maybe four months tops. Yeah. So, so that to me, that's the only thing that's going to limit end game from being the highest grossing movie of all time. So yes. A- any questions in terms of is this going to win records? Yes. Yeah. I don't think I don't know, dude. Like, because Force Awakens is far in front of Avatar and in, in domestic U.S. gross, like it's uh, it's almost two hundred million dollars higher in domestic gross than Avatar, and that's with Avatar's second release. And if we look at worldwide, yeah, like it's gonna be right now, like it's a billion dollars off from Avatar. That's a the Avatar did two. Two point seven eight. Endgame's only a billion off after a week. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. Like I said, it's 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 gonna do it. I think that like what's gonna propel this is that it, the foreign 
box office for this movie is like something we've never seen before. It, it's the highest grossing uh, foreign film in China ever. Yeah, already a week in, a week in. Yeah, like it's it's, it's <laughs> I mean, gonna so smash yes. it. Yes, it's probably going to be TFA domestically, and it's probably going to win out. And the only reason it won't is because they just don't keep movies in in theaters that long anymore. Yeah, so I'm, I, I I I can't tell you the last movie outside of Avatar that's been kept in a theater for close to nine months. Yeah, so it's, it's just, it doesn't happen. It's gonna be it's gonna be really interesting to see how this like this next weekend is gonna is gonna tell a lot about whether this passes TFA domestically and whether it's going to hit the top of the um the stu- like the worldwide box office. The funny thing is, dude, if you look at worldwide grosses all time, Disney has 1 2 3 probably the top four, 10 at five. this point. It's got 6 in the top 10. Yeah. It's disgusting. It's got Star Wars Force Awakens number 3, uh, Infinity War number 4, Endgame right now is at number 5. <laughs> then it's got <laughs> It's a week old. Yeah, then it's got the the first Avengers movie is number 7. Then it's got Avengers Age of Ultron is number 9 and Black Panther is number 10. Like <laughs> Like do you think Kevin th- fucking Feige? I mean, <laughs> Feige literally should have at least 10 billion dollars. Yeah, the, like the the amount of money. You gotta that, be kidding me, man. The, yeah, the amount of money that he's made for Disney. This guy's produced twenty two fucking movies that have probably grossed close to ten billion dollars. Yeah, it's disgusting, dude. Just it's like fucking crazy, man. All done in eleven years, dude. Rolling down this list, holy fucking hell! Like, and people trying to tell me that there's Star Wars fatigue. Fuck. You. Yeah. <laughs> the MCU has proven to everyone that there's no fucking thing as fatigue as long as you're putting out good content. Yeah. I mean, the MCU up until this year, and hell, even this year, they're still rolling out three movies. I think they're going to scale it back after this year because we're switching phases and kind of there's been a torch passing. Yep. But really, for the past five years, right, Nick, we've had three MCU movies a year. You typically get an early spring, a summer, and maybe a late summer fall. Yeah, it's and that's what we're getting here. We got Captain Marvel, Endgame, Spider Man. Yeah, so they're just gonna keep fucking. Rolling. Don't give me this bullshit fucking Lucasfilm like uh, one movie a year fatigue. We fucked up. We got it. No, you have to do better. That was just that was just piss poor planning and and reading tea leaves on your fucking part. Yeah, like they can. Like, don't, don't give me this bullshit that fans are are worn out or fucking blown out from star wars movies fuck off yeah so it's gonna be interesting to see how i'm i'm i mean obviously we're excited for fucking for rise of skywalker the expectations have definitely been raised though like oh it, it, exactly i mean they, they're already high but after seeing Endgame for four times in a row now they're super high i mean yeah. come on don't let me down here. Don't don't let the the this little baby compared to you MCU outshine you in your greatest moment, Star Wars. Yeah. So, looking forward to seeing Rise of Skywalker in theaters, seeing if it can live up to the hype. Until then, we will continue to speculate. I I tell you what, I love that trailer on the big screen though. I've oh, now seen man. it in uh, Dolby Atmos, IMAX, IMAX 3D. I mean, just. Fuck, I love that fucking trailer. It's so good. I mean, that, the, the opening 20 seconds or whatever, the, the, the duel in the desert, come on. I mean, that could be Rise of Skywalker, and I'd give it a 10 out of 10. Yeah, dude, it's it's so like, good. That's all we see is this that exchange. Uh, I, I'm ready. And on the note of speculation, though, our Tuesday cast will continue the speculations from last Tuesday's cast. So last Tuesday we talked about a little bit of – Palpatine theories. How could he come back? Matt was talking about this Darth, or what was it? Palpatine, like uh, Voldemort Palpatine or Darth yeah, Voldemort. D- Dar- Darth Darth Voldemort. Yeah, so a lot a lot of theories on how he could come back and what is the, the way that it he got, makes it his It got Nick back thinking a little bit. So yeah, at the end of that podcast, I told people to keep an eye out on StarWarsTime.net that there would be a piece up, more speculation from me, around what this MacGuffin could be. We keep hearing about there's going to be a MacGuffin in the beginning of the movie that's going to bring the First Order and the Resistance together, and then that thing is going to lead them to the greater journey of the movie. I've put out a piece 
today dropped about an hour before we started recording. Today's Friday, May 3rd. So by the time if you're listening to this and you haven't read it yet, you're not a real fucking SWT fan. That's right. Go read this. Because this article, this piece of speculation I put out, I almost feel good enough to say take it to the bank. Oh, shit. He just pulled out a take it to the bank. This is it. Uh Uh-oh. We posted it up on on Instagram already today. One Six Shooter, one of our top five Instagram members from this week, posted on it. He commented and said, you know what? I think this is it. This is a good theory. It's a way that we can tie up pieces of Star Wars canon that have never been put in the movies before. So go read this article. Which pretty much means it's probably not going to (laughs) happen. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's a perfect explanation. So if you know what a holocron is, go give this article a read. Give us your feedback. Give us your feedback. If you don't, why the fuck are you listening to a Star Wars time podcast? Yeah, like, come on. It's never. I mean, let's go. Like everybody be knows. Real. I mean, this, this is definitely a a podcast for a niche niche type of group here. So yes, go read the articles. Go comment and like the YouTube videos. Go follow the social channels. Matt, take us home, buddy. All right, I was gonna say Nick's Nick's kind of doing my thing, which is much appreciated because <laughs> I'm the one that usually sounds like fucking a, a dirty salesman here at the end of the podcast or billy mays where i'm like hey (laughs) matt here for star wars time show we will clean it we will wax it we will rub it we will scrub it for 9.99 it's free 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 no but in all serious we we love you people i mean that's why we do what we do because we love star wars and there's always time for star wars time that's what we've been saying since we launched this venture back in november of 2018 uh first and foremost we want to thank Every one of you that's been interacting with us, dropping comments, leaving DMs on Instagram, trust me, we got a great one this week kind of letting us know, like, hey, stick with it, guys. We're digging it. We've loved it so much. We started diving back into your old shows back when we were still on the EB. I mean, that is, that's why we do this. That's why we live. That's why we breathe. That's why we break out our lightsabers on Friday to wing it around and talk all things Star Wars. So keep doing what you're doing. Keep bringing that feedback. Let us know what you want to hear. I mean, if you got topics you you think we're missing, please bring them up. If we're fucking shit up, let us know. We may not fix it because in the end, I don't give a fuck. Uh, But we do appreciate the feedback we have been getting. So keep it going. Keep those ratings going, the reviews, the likes, the subs, just like Nick was saying. Uh, It all goes a long way. I mean, we're, we're not sitting here... We're not busting out the, 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 the Patreon yet. We're not begging for money. All we're doing is asking you to, you know, if you like what we do, give us a little love. The, the, the easy stuff. The non-monetary type of stuff. Just the, the interactions, the likes, the comments, the ratings, reviews. It will help us excel. All right, my friends, as Nick said, we'll be coming at you, uh, well, hell, if you're listening to this fresh on a Tuesday... By tomorrow, we're going to have a his Holocron special topic, so make sure you're keeping those browsers tuned to StarWarsTime.net. That's the best way to keep on top of everything we're putting out throughout the week. That could be news posts, Star Wars art posts, web gems that I cook up, collectibles type of stuff, rants, raves, speculations, and just a podcast. So, I mean, we got our YouTube stuff on there, the podcast subscription links. We just filed to be added to TuneIn and Spotify, so hopefully those will be approved. And we'll have even more platforms for you to listen to the Star Wars Time Show on. All right, people, you got all that? You got your homework for next week? Well, let me add some more. I mean, if you are a Star Wars at- artist, make sure if you're on Instagram to tag us, hashtag Star Wars Time Show, or just at Star Wars Time Show. We'll hit you. Or I might just find it and share it anyways, because in the end, it doesn't matter. We're not in it for us. We're in it for you. We're in it for Star Wars, because there's always time for Star Wars time. May the Force be with you, my friends, always. Always.